I, I really was seriously struggling to kind of maintain a mask anytime I did anything. And that was equally draining as what was actually going on. So every, I, I would, every time I was going somewhere, I'd be like, all right, I got to put on a happy face. I got to, no one can know anything's going wrong. And then if I couldn't do that, then I, every time I would have to think of some new wacky excuse why I couldn't make it or why I had to go home early. But I thought this is just, this is just killing me. I can't keep doing this. I'm going to have to eventually tell people about it. Luke Spadgick was always an energetic, optimistic person who didn't understand how people with seemingly nice lives could possibly get depression until it happened to him. With no obvious trigger, Luke found himself gradually slipping away from being that fun-loving guy everyone was used to. As the months went by, he lost the capacity to feel positive emotions, while at the same time, every negative one was amplified. Every moment, there's just something in the back of your mind saying, just give up, you can't do it, just stop. You may, you may as well just give up now. And it's just drilling at you every moment. With no clear explanation for what he was experiencing, Luke was confused, ashamed, and overcome by fear of what people would think of him if he told them what was really happening. Like that was the scariest thing, I thought. If anybody found out, everything would just come completely crashing down even more than it already was. Despite all his hopes, this didn't just go away on its own. Instead, it got worse and drove him shockingly close to the point of no return. Really didn't see how a thing was going to get better at all. I, I really had zero hope. But thankfully, Luke was brave enough to take a leap of faith and speak out about the grip depression had on him. Only then did it start to loosen, and as he fought tooth and nail to drag himself back up, he realised facing his demons by talking about them was the only way to beat them. There's a misconception that only people who've been through something terrible can get depression, but as Luke's story explains, it can happen to anyone, because depression doesn't need a reason. Welcome to Young Blood, a podcast all about young men's health. My name's Callum McPherson, I'm a journalist, and this is our mission to talk about the stuff that matters and isn't talked about enough. Let's do it. All right, Luke, when did you first realize that there was something that was really off with you, how you were feeling? It was quite a gradual process. I, there were a couple of signs that I didn't really pick up. Um, this was probably end of 2013, and I just... One of the first things I noticed was that I was not really enjoying things which I previously enjoyed and also just getting quite frustrated for no particular reason at really small things. But it really kind of hit home the end of that year when I was away with friends, uh, which I usually would have been looking forward to and usually would have been having a good time, but just was really unable to... I guess, immerse myself in the experience or have a good time at all. And then I thought, there must be something going on here, really. And that was at a festival? Yeah, so that was at Falls. And um, I'd previously been looking forward to it, but then sort of lost the ability to look forward to things, I think. And then uh, when I got home, I thought, I better go see a doctor just to see. It could be nothing, Could might be something worth checking out. Um, but that, that decision itself took quite a while. And then, uh, how long had you been feeling like that before you you made that call? Too long, really. Uh, so this would have been uh, started going downhill about August of 2013, and then the, I didn't go see a doctor until January. So it was quite a steady decline, I guess. Uh, I'm sure you were expecting to feel better though. Any moment you were probably thinking, you know, this is just a phase. I, I'll I'll snap out of it, sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. So that's one of the reasons I was hesitant. I thought, you know, I might just be having a bad week, bad month, these things happen, but just really persisted and uh, kept going downhill, essentially. And can you just really explain how that felt day to day, like how it was different to get up in the morning, how it was different interacting with people? Uh, what did you really notice um, in terms of the symptoms of it? Yeah, well, that, that's one of the things that confused me as well, because I think I had this idea that mental illness is uh, essentially just sad the whole time. Whereas, uh, like I said, I was getting really easily frustrated. I couldn't concentrate at all. I also sort of had every negative experience at once. So some, sometimes I would be sad. Sometimes I would be angry. Sometimes I would be just bored. Sometimes I wouldn't feel anything. And then um, would 
get frustrated because I wouldn't know what I was actually feeling down about. Yeah. That was probably one of the hardest parts. So it's like all the negative emotions were brought into focus and the positive ones that would normally pop up were a lot harder to come by. Yeah, I think I almost see it as a filter where you're kind of screening out everything that's positive and amplifying everything that's negative. So you might get completely devastated by smallest thing going wrong. Like I remember once I uh, was going to go somewhere particular for lunch um, and that was probably the best thing I had going on that day and the place was closed and I just broke down and I was like, what is going on? Yeah, right. And so how had you been prior to that, you know, in your young life, what kind of a, a person were you used to being? I was fine. I, uh, I I was quite proud of the fact that I didn't really get stressed out about things. If I had an exam or something like that coming up, I would kind of just get on with it. I, um, To be honest, I didn't really understand why people got stressed. I um, thought I was pretty up and about and... Um, I guess pretty resilient. I also had, uh, I used to actually get in trouble for smiling at teachers while they were telling me off. <laughs> so I think that I, it wasn't uh, a matter of, I guess I had this perception in my mind that mental illness was something that happened to people who would have been an emo and listened to My Chemical Romance and walked around mm. in a black trench coat. Right, yeah. So but, that's someone totally different to you. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, upbeat sort of person who had a pretty energetic social life and sort of saw yourself as, as quite the opposite of what you quickly found yourself turning into. So what was it like realizing that that wasn't going away and, in fact, it was getting worse? I think that was the hardest part because I, uh, when I went to a doctor, I thought, all right, there must just be something weird going on. Maybe I... Um... I don't know, maybe there's something wrong with my thyroid, maybe uh, it could be anything really. And then when I went there and they kind of explained, um, all right, this is actually, there's something going on here. And then kind of explained that this is not something that's going to go away. And then that was, that was definitely the hardest part, realizing that it's not just something that I was going to snap out of the next day and wake up. Because it, it did really, uh, although it, was, it, didn't, it wasn't one day I was fine and one day the next, it did sort of come on out of nowhere. So I was expecting, all right, well, it's just going to go away out of nowhere. Yeah, of course. And you did a test at the doctor's as well. Yeah. So I, I didn't even know there was a test, but um, I just filled out a questionnaire when they asked things like, um, how much are you enjoying life or those sorts of questions. And it was uh, 40 out of 40 on the depression scale, which was really quite confronting because I still had this uh, perception of my mind of, is there anything actually wrong? Am I just imagining this? Um, but that really hit home that, all right, there is really something going on here. Yeah, but you're literally as negative as you could possibly get in doing that test. Yeah, exactly. How did the doctor respond to when they saw that? They were pretty shocked that I, uh, th th I think their f first reaction was, what took you so long to come in? And I just thought, I don't know. I didn't think there was anything wrong. I thought, yeah, I don't know if, if I'm just imagining things or. Well, you didn't think you had a good enough reason. Yeah, exactly. And uh, since I didn't ha really have a perception of myself as the sort of person that this would affect, I just thought it, 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 it honestly didn't even really cross my mind uh, this could be depression or something. I thought that just wouldn't happen to me. And how were people in your life reacting at that point? At what point did you know your parents and your friends know that there was something off? Did your friends realize when you were at Falls Festival that – there was something going on with you or were you good at hiding it? I think by that point, I'd gotten pretty good at hiding things or if I was feeling down, then I would just go. I, I think that festival, I spent a lot of time just uh, sitting in a friend's car, really not knowing what to do and not really wanting to uh, show people how I was feeling. So I, I would either put on a mask or if I didn't feel up to putting on a mask, then I would go and hide essentially. So I think um, I, I realized at a later date, no, I actually didn't realize that my friends had noticed something was going on until I did start speaking out about this. And then a friend, we were out once and we'd have a couple of drinks and he said, yeah, we all, we all noticed something weird was going on, but we thought you might even have cancer or something. They, they didn't, they, it didn't even cross their mind that it would be something mental because mm. uh, they, they seen that I'd stopped going out and I must have seen to 
stop enjoying things and uh, having a good time when I was out. And they thought if you wanted to talk about it, then you would, but it might, must be something serious going on. And I guess that's especially hard in that situation because you don't even really know what it is or how to explain it. And I guess your fear is that they'll say, well, the typical response of why don't you just snap out of it or, or think positive or not understand what you're talking about and, and judge you on that because it's not something like cancer where everyone knows that that's a, a terrible thing that people understand and they go, okay, yes, you know course you should be feeling the way that you're feeling but when it's something that you can't fully articulate you're worried that people are just gonna judge you and, and be confused and sort of brush it off and say get over it yeah exactly that was the scariest thing i thought i po can't possibly let anybody know because they'll think that uh, there's something wrong with me they'll think that i'm weak they'll think i'm unstable they'll think i'm a burden they, they won't want to talk about it no one's going to want to hang out with me and I especially can't let uni or my employer know because they're going to think I'm unreliable. And uh... yeah, so you felt like your future was at risk and your identity was at risk as well. You know, who you'd built yourself up to be was on the line. And if people found out that you were feeling this way, then you would lose that, that credibility that you built, built up around your friendship circles and within yourself as well. So it must have been pretty terrifying to. Yeah, exactly. I was. I, I, yeah, because I, I, I wondered why would I put in so much effort to kind of maintain a mask and hide uh, this from people. But I think that it's, I did think that if anybody found out, everything would just come completely crashing down even more than it already was. And people would just would never view me the same. And so when did it get to the point where there was there was no hiding it and you had to change that mindset and it sort of you know, took over? So that was that was really that took a long time. Uh, so I told one friend, uh, who I r was really supportive. Uh, this was probably uh, getting to the middle of 2014, so almost a year after it had started. I told the first person, and I was absolutely terrified. Um, it's probably still one of the scariest things, and I, I still do find it quite scary telling new people. But that was uh, really make or break for me. I think if they uh, they did respond really well, but then that kind of gave me faith. Wow, wow, this person really didn't just write me off. They still, they're still there. They're still my friend. They're yeah. they're actually uh, caring and concerned for me. And then, even after that, it took a few months. And then it was really a, a sudden decision of I um, was awake one night, uh, not being able to sleep. A few months later, and I heard of uh, the Semicolon Foundation. Just briefly explain what they're about. Yeah, so Semicolon Foundation is a mental health awareness, uh, I guess, organization. And the, the semicolon is used in a sentence where uh, the author could end the sentence but didn't. So it's kind of a metaphor for being in a position where you uh, might have considered ending your own sentence in, in your life but didn't. And um, when I heard about that, I thought that's really powerful and that's a really good advocacy message. So I thought if, if I had seen somebody who I knew in a similar position uh, speak out and know that, okay, their, their life hasn't gone to shit because of this, uh, there's, they still have friends, they still have been able to maintain some degree of their life, I think I would have been a lot more open about it. So I kind of decided then and there I need to make sure that I never – don't speak out about this. And then uh, essentially the next week I got their uh, logo tattooed so that I wouldn't have a show choice. Me, show me that. So, th so th this is actually uh, one of the worrying things about it. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, just hold it up a bit and turn it maybe. Yeah, yeah. So either no, I was so committed uh, that I thought I, I never want to shy away from this. I always want it to be something that I'm open about. I still got it deliberately exactly under where a watch would be so that if there were situations where i w which i which I, w I wish i didn't now i wish i got it somewhere where i didn't have a choice but to show it but i thought um especially employers i thought just in case you didn't want to have it visible at all times <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so i guess i thought that uh, if i'm going for a job interview or something and people say this that people are going to Think, why would I? Why would I hire this person? They're unstable. Yeah. Why? Why? Why would you? You'd be crazy to do that. <laughs> yeah. So I guess, um, but that, that's really the opposite of the response I've had. To be honest, 
Um, so do people know what that symbol means? No, people ask. Uh, yeah. Some people know. Uh, but I think people that know are generally people that have had some experience themselves with mental illness and come across it that way. Mm. And other other times people ask, and I still do. It, it, I still get scared telling new people that don't yet know. There, there is there is still a bit of fear of how's this person going to react, and uh, some often people don't really know what to say in the moment. I think that's a really powerful symbol and a and a really interesting idea that they've come up with there, and it's brave of you to wear it like that. And obviously, it speaks to the significance that this whole experience has had had on you, and the fact that you know you want to hold on to that throughout your life and and not forget it obviously and then also remind yourself that you given the fact that you've been through this you can now actually help other people and and try to see when someone else might need help and then you can actually be the one to your your shoulder to them so i think that's that's so powerful man that's great yeah it has been uh re- almost almost overwhelming uh the i i thought that all right, maybe there's a small chance that this might help one person one day go seek help. But then I as, as, as also started uh, at the same time trying to speak out on social media and i not a writer or anything, but I was just kind of putting out my thoughts and saying, this is what's been going on. Uh, don't really have any answers, but this is what's happening. Uh, trying to, going to try to be open about it. Hopefully it might help someone. And then I sort of, inundated with messages of people saying i've uh really struggled i haven't told anybody but i'm going through something different um like really shocked that this could happen to you i thought there was something they, they essentially thought what i thought they thought there's something wrong with me no one else i know would be going through no this one would understand it and yeah, exactly. i'm alone with it yep and so getting that response what did that make you think or how did that change your view of what you were what you were going through well, it made me realize that uh, everybody else sort of has the same fear and everybody else is terrified of speaking out and telling their friends and telling anybody. And uh, it sort of made me realize that lots of the people were messaging me as well. I was equally surprised uh, that they had gone through something similar. Lots of these people were people that I respected a lot and looked up to. And um, I think it, w- it was really shocking, to be honest, how many people had gone through something similar. And um, I think I was also shocked that I, yeah, like I said, I thought this might help one person one day, but I, it, I think the fact that um, they'd seen someone similar and realized it isn't just them did seem to help people a lot and kind of gave them the courage of um, going to speak to someone or get help, whether that's by telling a friend or a doctor. So I think, um, yeah, I really have no regrets at all about uh, trying to be as open about this as possible. That makes such a difference. How did you go from being terrified to tell one friend to being willing to tell your entire social network? It was still terrifying, to be honest, and it is still scary. I think that's one thing that I would tell people is that it's it's you're not going to get to a point one day when you're like, okay, this isn't scary anymore. I'm going to go tell everybody now. It's always going to be scary, but I think I just thought this person reacted well. Um, I, I, I really was seriously struggling to kind of maintain a mask anytime I did anything. And that was equally draining as what was actually going on. So every, I, I would, every time I was going somewhere, I'd be like, all right, I got to put on a happy face. I got to, no one can know anything's going wrong. And then if I couldn't do that, then I, every time I would have to think of some new wacky excuse why I couldn't make it or why I had to go home early. And I thought this is just this is just killing me. I can't keep doing this. I'm going to have to eventually tell people about it. Uh, so I may as well just get it out in the open. And uh, like I said, I thought that there was a, there was quite a big risk. Uh, I thought that people might write me off. People might think I'm crazy. People might think there's something wrong with me. But um, eventually they're going to find out. So I may as well just figure out now whether that's going to happen. And uh, that was it, really. And what power was there in leaning into that fear rather than desperately trying to get away from it, accepting it, leaning into it, what happened? Well, I think I did realize that uh, people don't see something wrong with you. People are actually really supportive. They uh, they care. They want to help. Even if people don't know exactly how they can help or what to say, I think just the realizing that people were still going to accept me was probably one of the most helpful things that's happened in this whole journey. 
and also realizing just how many other people were, you know, in the shadows feeling similar to the way that you were feeling and then they were brave enough to want to speak up and tell you about it. So you must have realized like, hey, this is so much bigger than I thought. Yeah, because I, th- I think you, you do hear about famous people who have had mental health problems um, or you do hear, you obviously hear stats of uh, this many people have a mental health problem at the time. But I think if it's not someone you know personally, even if that's loosely, I think it would be hard to relate and you could be like, oh, well, I don't know what's happening to this person. They might be, uh, they might have one of these characteristics which I kind of stereotype people to have who have mental illness. So I think that, if it's someone personal, then they can be like, oh, wow, this person, I, 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 use, I can relate to this person. This person is just another young person like me and that's happened to them. So there isn't anything wrong with me. Do you think there's that misconception in society that you don't have the right to be depressed or you can't be depressed unless you have an extreme external factor or a reason that's leading you to be? Yeah, exactly. Definitely. And I think I did feel guilty. Uh, I-, I felt super bu- guilty about being depressed. I was like, I'm living in a nice country. I have a roof over my head. I have a family. I have friends. I have uh, things I usually like doing. What right do I have to be depressed? I I'm, I'm not living in poverty. I don't have some serious physical illness. I haven't been abused as a kid. W- I just saw it as self pity, really. Mm. I didn't realize that uh, it, it, the the emotions and the the feeling of it and the severity can be just as real, even if you don't have those external factors. Because you understood that logically, but that was beside the point. I mean, some harsh critics would say, "Well, that's pathetic. You need to just get over it, pick yourself up." You know, there's that that blockage where people just don't understand how that works. Um, so it wasn't as simple as knowing, okay, I should be, I should be fine. Therefore, I am fine. It was, you know, this is my situation. I know my circumstances, but that's not affecting how I feel. Yeah, I think that's why um, I, I do. I, I, I get why people would say, look on the bright side. And I think that um, I, I, I guess I understand why they would say that. But the, the fact is that I was extremely aware at the time that there wasn't any big external problem. I knew I could recognize, okay, this is going okay in my life. This is going okay. I should be happy and grateful. I I thought should, but that made it even worse because then I thought, why am I feeling like this? Uh, I shouldn't be feeling like this. And then that almost made me feel worse because I was feeling guilty about being depressed as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that adds that other dimension to it, that guilt and that shame that comes along with it when you don't have one of those stereotypical reasons to be able to pin it on because then you're worried that you know your parents are going to feel like you're a burden or that you're generally going to feel like a, a burden to everyone in your life and then that makes it so much deeper and, and darker for you. So I just think that's, that's so interesting about the case that you're speaking about and I have no doubt that there would be so many people that can relate to that where they feel an extra need to hide it because they can't explain it as well as if something terrible will happen to them. Yeah, because I think lots of people say, oh, why? Uh, if you say, I'm having this problem, they're like, oh, why? Yeah, absolutely. Like, That's well, the typical response. For sure. I have no idea. There is no reason. Mm. There wasn't any uh, super tragic thing that happened to me and then the next day I was depressed. It just sort of did gradually come out of nowhere and I, I also didn't know why. I still don't know why. And I, I, I don't think there necessarily is a reason why. And I think the one thing I did find inspiring, which helped me speak out, was um, somebody, uh, I guess as a young uh, Australian male, I looked up to uh, AFL players as sort of potentially higher than I should have. But uh, Buddy Franklin who was someone I looked up to as a, obviously a guy who was uh, doing really well at sport. Everything seemed to be going well in his life. And then he took the finals off uh, for mental illness. And I thought what this guy is living the dream essentially and then i looked up oh i wonder if any other famous people have uh, had this problem and there's more than you expect that's one of the things that i personally found helpful was thinking wow these people i also look up to who every every, every externally everything seems to, that it could be going better yeah more so than you as well yeah exactly like people i was looking up to and uh, i guess tri- striving towards these people have equally having problems mm. 
And so then that was really proof to you that there is more going on here and it, it isn't about what you have or your external life or the status that you have. It's, it's something that can just definitely affect everyone. So I guess that made you feel like, okay, well, I'm not the only one going through this and I don't need a, a reason or a justification. The fact is that it's happening and I have to deal with it. Um, how did you how did you deal with it? How did you go from being at that point where you were, you know, got the semicolon tattoo and went to the doctor and got 40 out of 40 on that test? How did you start to get yourself out of it or get back to who you were before? I'm not going to lie. It was a long, difficult process. Uh, there was one point where I was, uh, when I first started seeing a psychologist, I was going three times a week. I was seeing my GP on top of that. I had to see a psychiatrist and get medication, which I was really hesitant about. I, I was really hesitant about that, which I think uh, is sort of the, that c comes with the package of thinking, what's wrong with me? There's nothing actually wrong. I, uh, why should I need a pill? You uh, thought that would put you into another category of, of mental illness that you thought you weren't worthy of. Yeah, and I think I almost saw it as uh, cheating in a way or that it would take away who I really was. If I'm taking this pill and it's going to change, uh, the, the point of it is to make you feel differently. Is that going to change who I am as a person? Am I still going to be myself? Um, but I think over time, uh, one thing I did find really frustrating at the time is when people say, uh, with time, think these things will get better. And I thought, that just doesn't seem to be true at all. I'm just still going downhill. Time's only going to make it worse. Uh, how am I possibly going to... Because you'd already seen, you'd given it a lot of time and it hadn't done anything for you. Yeah, exactly. So I thought if if, if I still am following this trend in a year, I already thought I couldn't possibly feel worse. But um, I think I was, I was already kind of at the depths of how low I could have felt. Um, but I really didn't see how a thing was going to get better at all. I, I really had zero hope. I thought that, um, I, I remember pr probably one of the biggest sort of moments of realization for me was when I was um, overseas. And I guess this, this points to the fact that I um, managed to go overseas. I uh, was having a really good trip externally, but I was still really struggling inside. And I'd done some... Uh, seemingly crazy things like uh, the first time I ever went mount mountain biking was somewhere called Death Road and I uh, started out a bit hesitant but then sort of gunned it, nearly fell off the edge and uh, came off my bike, dislocated my shoulder and almost fell off a 300 meter cl uh, cliff but I was pretty unfazed and then uh, the next day I went skiing for the first time, almost fell in a crevasse because I didn't know how to ski, it was on a glacier and then a few days later I was thinking, why didn't these things phase me? I was, I was really unfazed. I thought, shouldn't I be more careful about this? And I think I was more scared at the time of still being around and still feeling like this than I was of falling off a cliff. When I was, this is just, this is not how things should be. So then I really had to kind of think, okay, I, I can't, I, I think I was really hesitant initially to kind of strip back things back. I, I didn't want to defer uni i wanted to maintain everything but i was just super struggling so i thought all right i really need to put this first first and foremost if i can't sort this out and i don't prioritize this then nothing else matters really so i had to defer uni i had to see a psychologist a lot i uh, had to really get a hold of my physical health so i had to really look after my sleep uh really pay attention to what i was eating trying to get exercise and these things were super difficult sometimes even just brushing my teeth on a day would be a hard task but i thought even if i do something like that i need to see it as a win and sort of battling against this kind of shadow trying to drag me down and uh kind of every hour i make it through is one hour closer to being on the other side so i think i it was there wasn't sort of a magic formula of this got me better. It was really just a matter of get, getting the help that I needed, trying to be open about it and getting support, really stripping it back to what, what can I realistically achieve at this time and still being kind of proud of myself for getting through that and uh, really prioritizing my health. 
Right. Well, you obviously you had that moment where you fronted up to your de- demons, you faced your demons. You know, you've been running from it for all these months, and as you said, gradually things had gotten worse. They hadn't gotten better because you'd still been trying to hold on to your pride and and not front up to it and sort of just hope it would go away. And it was only when you said, "Well, I have to face this, and I have to make it a priority." And I have to do the work. And you said you broke it down to every hour. You had to be super disciplined doing every little thing. And just explain how much harder that is to do to get good sleep, to exercise, to do those normal things that we take for granted and that you used to take for granted. How much harder is that to do when you have depression? Yeah, it, 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 is, it is hard to describe, but there would be days where I just felt literally incapable of moving. And I would be like, all right, I need to get out of my bed and I haven't eaten anything today or I haven't had any water. And I would just need to, I would sit there for an hour and be like, all right, I got to do this. But I would just have zero energy effort for no reason. And it would just seem like an insurmountable task. And sometimes I couldn't do it. Sometimes I could, but it, it, it is hard to describe, but it's, it's almost like you've lost the ability to um, do a simple task. And if you think of a time when you've really struggled to do something and you've been like, uh, I don't know, if you're exercising really hard or something, you're like, oh, should I just give up? But every moment there's just something in your back of your mind saying, just give up. You can't do it. Just stop. You may, you may as well just give up now. Uh, you, you got no energy. What's the point of doing this? You're feeling crap anyway. What's the point of eating? Why, why would you eat? And it's just drilling at you every moment. So that's why uh, I think that the the thing I mo- am most proud of uh, out of everything is just getting through this, essentially. I didn't achieve, uh, uh, apart from getting through it at the time, I had to stop uni, I had to stop everything. I didn't really externally achieve anything else. But I think just when you've gone through it, you see how difficult it is day to day, minute to minute. Just the fact that you were still alive at the end of it is uh, something I do see as an achievement. Yeah, well, you were fighting for your life and it was a strange battle as well and one that I, I'm sure you feel like won't ever fully be won or one that you have to keep in check because it's not like you just recovered and then that's it forever. Unfortunately, with these sorts of things, it's something that you learn from and then you have to be mindful of as, as you go forward. Um, and. Throughout that experience, you know, it was such a struggle day to day and I can't imagine the pressure of, of that, you know, inside your own mind where it's really just you battling yourself, but you still did those things, you know, no matter how much that voice told you not to, you still most of the time overpowered it and managed to do it and bit by bit, did, it, did that voice quieten down or at what point? after completing those tasks one by one and and forcing yourself to take those actions and slowly build yourself up, did it get easier? Yeah, I think um, it was a matter of things slowly sort of getting better. That that was probably a matter of um, trying to just get through the weeks while talking to a doctor. I started taking medication and these things sort of all added up. And then I also, I think that the fact that I was viewing uh, every task that I did did do as sort of, I guess, like punching the shadow in the face almost, <laughs> um, did start to make things, uh, uh, I guess, get on the up and on the mend. And I, I can't really look back and say, this is the moment where I um, did X, Y, and Z, and then it got better, better. It was really a difficult struggle. And I think it is really just a matter of um, prioritizing it getting the help you need, and then very slowly things will start to get better. If you do all those, take all those actions and, and are really diligent about pushing yourself to do the things that everything inside you tells you that you, you shouldn't do. Yeah. So it's not a matter of just sitting and waiting like you had to take those actions or you had to force yourself to do those things. And that was the, the really tough part of it. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's not like... You can wait around and then one day you'll be like, all right, today I feel like going to the doctor. Today I feel like uh, prioritizing this. Today I feel like telling people. It's always going to be a struggle. And that just the sooner you can do, uh, realize that 
this is always going to be hard. It's never going to be something easy. I just got to do it. I, if I, I got to do it today or in six months, it's going to be equally as hard. I just got to do it, essentially. I think that's the same thing with telling people. It's still, it's still difficult. I, it's, not, it's not like I'm, I, I uh, thought about coming here and I'm like, this is the easiest thing in the world to talk about. And it's just completely blasé. It is something that is uncomfortable. And the, the sooner you can do something, no matter how difficult it feels at the time, the sooner you're going to start feel, feeling better and getting on the right path. Was there a scientific reason for it? Was Did the doctor try to explain to you what was going on and, and make it make logical sense? Or what was the closest you got to an understanding of why, why it happened? Yeah, so th there are... Th I, think, I think that is something that did help because uh, especially with the psychologist, I thought that since there's some, nothing... Clearly external. I, I I can't think of a problem. What what would I possibly tell the psychologist about? There's nothing I can go and they said, oh well, this tragic thing happened to you. Let's talk about that. I thought, what what are they going to talk about? But I think just breaking it down in terms of the science of there are physical things going on in your brain. There is, uh, for example, all these uh, neurotransmitters and hormones involved. So did you have chemical imbalances that you knew of, or? Yeah, well, that, that, that's what uh, they say, yeah, and that's why uh, people think that medications help. And I think that really realizing that there actually is something physical going on helped because if I had diabetes and I needed insulin or I had a thyroid problem and I needed uh, medication, you wouldn't really think twice about it. You'd be like, right, fair enough. But I think realizing that there was something physical going on um, and then breaking down what exactly it is sort of explains uh, why it is that you are feeling these things. Then you sort of feel less stupid for feeling them, essentially. So I think especially in terms of uh, I started feeling anxiety over time. And when a psychologist just break it, broke it down to me that, right, there's uh, hormones involved in stress and you've got a higher level of the, the moment. And that means that you've got more blood going to your muscles, which makes you feel tense. And then you've actually got more energy being used by your bread, back brain, which is why you're exhausted. And then since you've got a higher background level of these things, it takes less to set you off. And I thought, oh, I'm not crazy. This makes sense. And so you feel like you, you have a pretty strong understanding of it now? or I think that I have a stronger understanding, but it, it, it is something that's quite complicated. I don't think you need to become an expert in the area, but even just understanding the real basics that there's something physical going on here and this is how it might be causing one or two of your symptoms can help to make you realize that it is something that you need to address how are you now because this was this was the height of this you're talking about yeah you know, six years ago well, i think like you said it's not something um where i sort of completely broke free of it and i think it is something that i have to maintain and stick with over time i have had to still um Sleep seems to be a big thing for me. I need to really look after my sleep. I need to make sure I'm exercising and make sure I'm eating well. I need to not push myself to the absolute limits in terms of work or partying or anything like that. But I definitely am considerably better. And I think that there's some times where I, I will have a hard month. Uh, the end of last year, there was a couple of months where I had a particularly hard time. And I think uh, that was because previously uh, depression was the main problem. And I had glim glimpses of anxiety for short periods of time, but that was um, for, for the similar th similar story, really. Out of seemingly nowhere, it sort of came, and I uh, think I got good coping mechanisms for depression. I think that's one reason why time help does help, because you think that you realize what, what you kind of need to do yourself, what are things that makes it worse for me, what are things that help. Um, and then you kind of learn those lessons, you can implement those, and you sort of know the warning signs. And if you start going downhill, you go, I, I, I need to strip things back. I need to really prioritize this at the moment. But I didn't have any of those coping me mechanisms for anxiety. I still didn't really uh, even realize the degree of it. And there was one point where I, um, I guess you, you get like an overwhelming fear of nothing in particular. And I remember I was once at uni and I just, started to feel a bit weird and then i couldn't really breathe and i thought this is weird i need, I, I i feel like i'm dying and i had to go to hospital essentially and then it turned out that it was uh I, there was nothing physically wrong with me it was the anxiety and then uh it took a month or two to really get a hold of that and uh kind of 
accept it. And I think that I went through a similar struggle of trying to fight it rather than, uh, I guess, accepting this is where I am at the moment. But I think overall, um, I'm considerably better, which is good because if you asked me five years ago, are you ever going to get better? Is there any hope at all? I would have said no, straight out. And I think that the, the more you battle it and the more you fight it, the more you realize you can. And then you can look back and say, all right, I was this down at that point in time. Um, if I'm feeling bad this week, I got through that, I can get through this. And I think the, the longer you battle and fight on, the easier it is to look back and say, it's never going to be easy. It's never going to be something that's fun and that you just can completely pass off. But I think that the more you learn about yourself and what works and the more you can look back and say, I made it through that, then the, the better it gets. Because you're building up this cache of evidence of, okay, it was really tough last time. I remember this and how I felt like I wasn't going to get through that, but I got through that. And the more you stack that up, the more you believe that, yes, you can move past whatever you're feeling that day. Um, yeah, I'm proud of you, man. Thank you. It's, it's very obvious you know, how much of a ordeal you've been through with that. And I think it takes real bravery to front up to it and not only to – Put in all that work when everything's screaming at you to give up, not only to do that for yourself, but then to want to be an advocate and really front up to that fear and put it out there as much as you can to to own it because I suppose you can't stop it happening to you. You can only decide how you're going to react or how you're going to um, front up to the situation and you've decided to empower yourself and, and others by using what you've been through to to help and what's that like for your own healing process and for your pride and the impact that you feel you can have as a young man i, th I think that's really important and i think that's something that i would encourage people to do no matter it, it, it is going to be really difficult but i think the, the fact that i have managed to hopefully help uh well I, i'm i i know that it's helped other people because Tons of people have messaged me, and I, I never thought that would be the case. But I think realizing that I um, sort of got through something really difficult, but then have tried to use it to help others, I think is something that makes it feel like it wasn't all just a complete waste. I think that if I can um, help others to get help and speak out, especially to speak out and to know that you can reach out to friends, you can tell people about this, you, you, you need to tell people about this. I think if even a couple of people take that advice, then I think uh, any level of uncomfort that I've had in being open about this is more than worth it. And it did turn out that a great deal of those fears about how people would judge you were in your head. Yeah, definitely. People have reacted positively. I, I, I never had somebody come up to me and say, oh, there's something wrong with you. You're weak as a person. There's like, you're a broken person. I don't, I don't like you anymore. But I've had... So many people say, oh, this is brave that you did this. It's helped me. Um, I think that it's, it, it's almost the complete opposite reaction that you would expect to get. Uh, even with employers, when I was having a difficult time and I said, look, I'm just not going to be able to do this work at the moment. This is why. Um, whereas previously, I was trying to think of excuses and come up with extensions and delays. As soon as you're like, look, this is what's going on. This is what I'm going through. I, I just either need some help or need to let you know this people are more than understanding and uh it really helps more than anything else you just got to trust sometimes no matter how scary that is you take that leap of faith and and not do it on your own because that's what makes it so much scarier and can make it impossible is feeling like it's you know it's only you and it has to be a battle that you fight by yourself and really take that that power away when you do that yeah exactly and so you're back at uni now can you be happy? Yeah, so I I definitely can be. I still um I still go to psychologist every couple of months. I'm still on medication, um and I think it is something that you kind of it, it it's like maintaining a healthy weight. It's not something where you go all right now I'm a healthy weight I can stop. It's something you kind of still got to eat well. You still got to exercise. You still got to look after yourself. But I uh, definitely in a much better position now. And I think not just because you experience what you experience i think we all have to do that and we all can't be naive and think that well that'll never happen to me and that's what you thought um 
not that you did anything wrong to make it happen to you, but we all have to look after our mental health, like our physical health. We all have to make sure we're sleeping right, we're eating right, we're exercising, we're opening up, we're talking about these things. Otherwise, we can very easily find ourselves in a spiral, in a hole like that, um, as you've explained, for no particular reason. So I think that's really going to be the, the message of this podcast is to people who might be feeling that way that they need to reach out and that that's actually going to be something that's going to turn the tide for them and to everyone else who isn't experiencing it that we still need to make sure we're being diligent and looking after ourselves because that can be us. Yeah, exactly. And I think some of the things that people recommend can sound a bit wacky or a little bit weird. Like, for example, the idea of mindfulness. I thought, what is this hippie nonsense? sitting down and kind of being with your thoughts. But I think that uh, things such as this do really help. And there's a reason that people recommend these things. And your health isn't something you can just take for granted. I think that you really do need to stay on top of it. And the more you can, the more kind of, uh, I guess, resilience or room you have to budge if something does go wrong. And I think that the more you look after yourself, I, I think that... Um, it's hard to say you'd be completely immune, but you're going to be in a lot better position. And even if you're not suffering a mental illness, you're going to be in a better position and having a better time overall if you're looking after your health. And if you're sleeping better, you're obviously going to feel better. If you're eating better, that's uh, the, all, all these things that you need to do for your mental health have a whole range of other benefits. How do you view being alive now? I think I... Since that was not something that I was sure would continue for a point in time, I think I almost uh, feel like I got a new lease on life. I thought um, the, the fact that I am alive is, it, it almost didn't happen really. So what am I going to do with this? I get a, uh, so I think I really sort of feel like, yeah, I, 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 that, that's the only way I can describe it. I feel like I almost got offered another chance at life and then, I had a chance to sort of start from scratch and build it up from the ground. Uh, and I, I, I still see that as an achievement and I see it as something I kind of want to try to make the most of and use it to help others rather than something that I'm going to uh, take for granted or waste. Grateful to be here. Definitely. Well, grateful to have you, man. Thank Likewise. you. Thank you for sharing your story. If you got something out of this episode, please leave a comment and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps us grow the show so we can keep bringing you the content that matters. If you want to stay up to date with what we're doing and get involved, get onto the Youngblood Podcast community Facebook group and follow Youngblood Podcast on Instagram. And if you're keen to get in touch with me, email youngbloodpodcast, all one word, at hotmail.com. This podcast was produced by the talented Rory Noak at Podbooth. You can check them out at podbooth.com.au. This is Young Blood. Thanks for joining us. Catch you next time.